So we're sitting in an Xbox party thinking what could possibly be more painful than actually playing Halo Infinite right now. Then it was at that moment we decided we're going to play Anthem for one whole week straight. Now the really interesting thing is Luke and I actually never gave Anthem a single shot. We never played it, didn't have any experience with it, didn't really even fully understand why the game had so much backlash. We remember some controversies and some discussions all the way back when it released. We didn't have a full idea of what the state of the game was really like. Matter of fact, at the point of us deciding to jump into this game, I didn't even know if the game was in first person or third person. So what would happen if we decided to force ourselves to sit down for seven days straight and just play Anthem and just give it our all and see if maybe the game actually is really good and we've just been sleeping on it this whole time. We got nothing else better to do, so we decided to take a closer look. So day one, booting up the game, oh boy, there's a little bit of an exposition dump and honestly at this point it doesn't make too much sense because we're just coming in completely fresh but maybe they'll explain some of the story a little bit later on. We do get this vague story with some enemy or something and there's this final city or it's one of the last cities that heroes known as freelancers are set to protect. I gotta say this sounds a little familiar to Destiny but hey, it's a common narrative trope, it's fine. After that we get this first person cutscene where we see this dude rallying the troops and then we slide into our smaller lesser cool suit and we go into the tutorial. Now personally I'm not a fan of co-op games having non-co-op tutorials but a lot of games do it this way so we just kind of have to deal with it. I don't know there's a lot going on in the tutorial though. There's this big massive moment where characters are dying and they're failing the mission and there's this giant storm tornado that has giants in it and there's just a lot of stuff going on. It, it seems pretty hectic. The mission is definitely food Bar. It's time to get out of there. It's this cataclysmic mess and then we get a time jump of two years into the future and now we're in modern day and things are in this fresh new mission taking place years later and we're still in this prologue tutorial thing but I have to say at this point in the game we were a little bit impressed at least with how graphically pretty the game was and the gameplay didn't feel like the worst so far. Sure first impressions the story might be generic and vague at the same time but the environment seems a little bit varied and it feels actually kind of nice to fly around and the little one part where you dip your head in the water was neat. I did think it was a little weird how the opening cutscene has you in first person and then when you're actually playing you're in third person but when you're at the hub area the equivalent of the tower or whatever you want to call it in this game you're in first person again which is kind of the opposite of what a game like Destiny does but it made sense why Destiny did it so you could see your cosmetic in a non-combat area in this game it literally seems like they chose to do this just to be the opposite. Anyways we didn't really know what we're doing we're just following through clicking the buttons that the game was telling us to click through there's this one character that says that we need to speak in private and demands that we just talk in this large open space where there's a ton of people standing around. Then after that when we started connecting our group together because we want to play through this game as a group we also messed around with some of our settings, started looking at our character, picking out what we were going to look like and while we did see the store already we were a little happy we at least didn't have to pay for an armor coating. So it was finally time we were going to get to play through the first level as a group and we were excited. We had the squad together. It was me, Rob, Rocket Elijah and I chose the Interceptor class because I like flying around and jumping. We had Rocket Luke, who if you didn't already know runs this channel and edits these videos for us, playing as a Ranger, mainly because he seemed like the most standard type of class. And then Dim, our friend who just shows up sometimes and he decided to play as a Storm. He just thought it looked cool. Our fourth Tails never actually ended up showing up for this because he was playing Elden Ring and he was stuck somewhere in the game so he never ended up remembering to install Anthem. So we just went as a 3Q into matchmaking and we got some random player called Eviscerator. I mean I can't think of a name that's more metal than Eviscerator so we're feeling pretty confident and he ended up picking the fourth class that we didn't have, the Colossus class. So we were a pretty balanced team going into this first mission. And actually at this point in the game, the first level seemed like a very good choice development wise or design wise to introduce players into what Anthem is supposed to play like. And I think this first level is a great example of the potential that this game had. I don't know, we were just getting used to running around, flying around and fighting stuff. Dim would just float there sometimes. I would fly and shotgun things in the face, which I really like to do. Luke was doing something and of course Eviscerator who was level 20 was eviscerating things I but yeah, the first level wasn't actually all that bad. We were just happy that after all of that tutorial stuff, we were able to actually play the game. Overall, it was just a very simple level. We just kind of move forward, walk around, explore things, shoot some stuff, kill a lot of stuff, 
and then you beat the level and move on. What we didn't expect is after completing the level and going back to the main hub area, we got a very, very long cutscene with a ton of exposition, which almost makes you feel like you missed a sequel game or something. Like this stuff should have been maybe introduced in the very introduction of the game instead of just randomly after the first level. Interestingly enough, we have a flashback to a different cataclysmic moment that's just insane with crazy things happening. And it's supposed to show how the perception of freelancers had changed and how people weren't really looking up to them as heroes anymore. Still, it seemed a little bit weird to have two giant moments that are setting up the story for the game. It almost makes me wonder if there were two ideas pitched for this game in an introduction extra explosive type moment and the game director just said yes to both of the ideas and then when they asked which one to go with for real he just maybe said yes again. For the next part, we were going into what is called a free roam level. And this is where I think the game probably ended up losing a lot of people, especially because of the confusion when you're playing with a group. Like all of a sudden we're all set off to do our own thing, but we're on the same quest. But we're supposed to run around and pick up some Ember currency for what looked like a side quest, but apparently it's a part of the story to upgrade our gear and stuff. And it doesn't track your progress together either. So everyone was off trying to find their own Embers. It's just a weird pacing thing where it encourages you to play co-op and play together with friends, but then it doesn't let you do this thing that's early on in the story, co-op. It's nothing earth shattering, other games do this type of thing too, but it's dumb in those other games a lot of the times and I kind of digress with this. After this, we pretty much were ready to wrap it up at this point for the first night and it kind of ended things off on a whimper after that long cutscene and then just a really boring level like this free roam thing, but we're optimistic. The first level itself wasn't that bad and some of the things in the tutorial were kind of cool, so maybe day two would be a little bit better. So boom, day two, we were loaded back in and we were optimistic that we would have a great time playing some Anthem. We quickly figured out those little Ember things that we needed to get finished up from the night before. And where things were kind of slowing down when we were on this weird free roaming mission, we remembered the first level was fun, so maybe level two this time around will also be kind of fun. Upon going into level two itself, this is kind of where the game's polish starts to maybe fall apart a little bit, where we praise level one for being a really good starting off point and a way to kind of showcase how you can approach enemies in different ways, specifically based on what build you have. This next level felt maybe a little looser and kind of stitched together. I don't know if I'm really explaining this as well, but it definitely felt less uniquely crafted and more just go here, kill this, and then go further into this dungeon area and load into a new area. I don't know if the loading screens in this game were worse when the game came out either, but but there definitely are a lot of loading screens throughout this game, especially when going into sections within the single level. It's not too often you play a game and you're in a regular level and then all of a sudden you go inside a room and you get a black splash screen and you have to load into the next part of the same level. Games like Halo and Destiny have loading zones, sure, but it's all one seamless thing. This one does seem a little more rough around the edges, but still the levels themselves that aren't a part of the free roam, at least as far as level two was concerned, was still more fun than that free roam mess that we had to deal with at the end of day one. So the quality may be declining a little bit with level two compared to the first level, but at the very least, the story, as much as it doesn't really make too much sense what's going on and who's who, it is interesting. I mean, there's some interesting things going on and some goofy lines. Back at the base, we found this new base area that's just attached to the main base, just completely empty. Just makes us wonder why this room even exists. We had to talk to a bunch of people in some side quest thing, so we just had to run around chatting it up with the randoms. Luke found his way to the store and ended up buying an $18 coin bundle so that he could buy a skin that he really liked that had rotated into the store. I normally criticize Luke for spending money on a game like this to make his character look cool, but his character did look pretty cool, so I can't say too much. Hey, this game may be completely dead, but you know the store will continue to work for however long this game continues to let you play it. We also rolled out onto another level and once again, it kind of did this thing we had to do during the prologue where we had to find these like orbs to open up some sort of door. Now, in general, it's all right. It's a repetitive process of having to fly around and look for things, but 
He puts us in this dense forest, and all we have is this little radar to go off of to find it. And honestly, it was just really tedious going around looking for these things. And then it goes into this next area where we have to look for things. It just seemed like a really odd mix and match. Like they had this beautiful environment and level that they wanted to use, and then they picked maybe the least fitting mechanic to base the level around. It's just a weird fit here. I'll be honest, by the end of day two, I was getting worried that this game was maybe a dead game in the way that it is for a very common reason that I see happen to a lot of games more recently. But if this game continues the way that it's going, I'm starting to wonder if I can understand why some players were really frustrated with this game. The game is absolutely atmospheric with tight gameplay and controls that honestly feel really good. But the game is boring. Or at least I'm worried that this game is going to get boring. I keep finding these collectibles called core texts, which are just this long text dump that doesn't really matter. And after we had to kill a bunch of these scorpion things, we were pretty much ready to move on and take a break for the night. Jumping into day three, we decided to do obviously more campaign to see how that would end up. We finally figured out the difference between critical objectives and agent quests, which are like side quests. And the thing is, some of the critical objectives require you to complete agent objectives objectives and it's pretty confusing. Also, we were starting to find it really annoying that we had to wait for the dialogue to finish up before the next objective would show up telling us where to go. I mean, it easily could have been a thing where they just start talking to us, giving us exposition while we're flying to the location. But for whatever reason, they chose to make it where you have to wait around for all the dialogue to end before they tell you where you're actually supposed to go. It seems like a nitpicky thing, but it gets really old after a while. At this point, we didn't really look too much into the gear and looting system. It seems pretty random and in general, I never fully understand how these things work until like a month into these types of games, but it's fine. I just kind of kept equipping the best stuff that I got along the way, and that seemed to be working just fine. Now, at this point, while we did praise the atmosphere feeling a little bit different in this game for the first couple of hours of playing, the map locale was definitely starting to feel a bit repetitive. But yeah, a lot of day three was just playing through a little bit of the campaign and trying to figure out how a lot of these mechanics actually work. On day four, we had a mission where we had to go fly around looking for stuff and then we got to kill some stuff and that was cool. I think the general charm and novelty of this game just being a new and fresh experience definitely was starting to wear off by day four. The game was starting to get incredibly repetitive and definitely not necessarily as exciting as the first day maybe was. There's a lot of doing missions and then going to the little hub fort area where you just have to do more talking missions along the way. And honestly, when you're doing these things, having to go to point A to point B just to talk to people, and then you accidentally talk to the wrong person and you get stuck in this side dialogue that has a dialogue tree that you can't skip your way out of quickly and you're just stuck there trying to get out of it. It's really, really annoying. Like we just want to go to where we're going, but instead we're stuck skipping through some weird, unnecessary dialogue tree. So finally hitting the midpoint of the game, things do start to get a little bit interesting for a moment in the story at least we get to this weird area where there's like a party or something and this dude eats a crab leg unlike anything we've ever seen before probably the highlight of the entire game to be honest and then after that section the level kind of just goes crazy we had to kill a bunch of stuff and actually the story was starting to pick up a little bit there was a little bit of atmosphere there's that weird crab leg moment again and just some interesting stuff going on with a little bit of chaos. So maybe the story was getting a little bit better, but then right after that, we had to go into one of those free roaming levels again, where it doesn't track our progress collectively and splits all of us up. And geez, to progress in this game any further, it just drops all of these objectives and challenges on you by having to access these different tombs that all have their own set of requirements you have to complete. And they're just little small things that really shouldn't be a core part of your progression in the game to let you continue the campaign. Like for instance, to progress through this section and be able to have access to the campaign moving forward, you have to complete all of these challenges like complete 50 melee kills, open up 15 chests, five world events, you had to get all of these combo kills which are kind of confusing to get at first, you had to revived down freelancers. The list goes on and on and honestly it's kind of overwhelming just how they drop this on you when you're just at the point where the story is starting to get good. It was actually really discouraging because we were just starting to feel excited about the game and then they're like hey here's a list of chores to fill your time up with anthem at this point we're really discouraged to the point where we just wanted to quit the game altogether and just honestly we'd rather just not play video games than have to play anthem and have to grind miserably through here so we called it quits for the night and we just kind of went off and watched the 1995 power rangers movie because why not and literally 
hours later, three to four hours later, we were joined up in a party with Dim, who apparently that entire time was sitting there grinding out all of those challenges because he just couldn't leave the game unfinished like that. So yeah, during all that, Dim managed to progress and complete all of the challenges so that he could go further in the campaign. So we ended that day with maybe the hopes that when we get back on Anthem again, Dim could take over as host and maybe we can all continue to play through the story together and at least see where the plot's going. Day five, we eagerly loaded up into Anthem, hoping for the very best. And fortunately enough, Dim was able to host the lobby for us to all join in and join when whatever main missions he was doing. It did result in us missing a little bit of the dialogue and story when he was in the fort, because for whatever reason, they wanted to lock that story to the fort section of the game. But nonetheless, all the bigger plot points we mostly got filled in on when we were playing the campaign levels with Dim, so we were able to move on and make more progress. Honestly though, on day five, despite the fact we were able to finally play together, plot-wise, none of us knew what was going on. The story has really just kind of devolved on itself. All of a sudden we're in this temple, and I mean, the level is interesting. This cutscene was interesting, though we were completely lost in the story. There's this ancient temple apparently with a tomb of ancient titan freelancers or something. I don't know what's going on. It, it's weird that they do this whole like ancient technology that's like not that old, but old apparently. It's like Halo, but not good. We were granted with the best insult of all time, which was pretty nice. He's trying to trace your location. I'm picking up Dominion soldiers in the area. No, there is no javelin. Get glitched. This level though, the pace was at least a little bit better than some of the things that we have seen in this game, and it wasn't the worst way to start off day five. Actually, moving forward with the next level, we ended up seeing our first ever boss fight, which was cool. We had this weird vision world that we're in. Still, no idea what's going on, and we had to do King of the Hill while we were in this vision world of ancientness. Meanwhile, while you're fighting stuff, there's a lot of voiceover exposition, like just a ton of exposition. This person is narrating and an entire book while you're fighting. I, I don't understand what's happening. Literally, the main consensus was that the story must be so good that we just don't have the comprehension skills to understand what on earth is actually happening. Honestly, the weird storytelling that's supposed to be overly epic was starting to get really excessive with how long this section was kind of playing out. And then they put this big story twist at the end of it, just making it even more confusing. And then once you finish that part out, you have to go back to the fort and do a couple of missions. Now, since we were behind, we just had to wait for Dim to go around and talk to whoever, and we couldn't really do too much. So in the meantime, while we were waiting, I decided to see how many NPC heads in the fort I could clip my character's face into, and the answer was six. So you're seeing them on your screen now, as I was able to stand there and wait for their idle animations to cut into my field of view, which is interesting because there is like an invisible barrier stopping you from getting too close. I felt like I accomplished something that was pretty unimportant. On the next level, there was a bunch of stuff going on. Also, there was actually a lot of boss fights. One of them was this massive bullet sponge we thought was, was pretty over the top, but nonetheless, we were able to defeat it. Going into the next level, there was a bunch of random turrets, and then we got this weird cutscene that was just a black screen with subtitles uh, and text. It, it sounded like something important was supposed to happen in this cutscene and we just, it just didn't load for any of us. The cutscene did later update and we could see something going on, but we had no sound. And I just decided to awkwardly voice all of the subtitles during this point, just for Dim and Luke's entertainment. But then the game froze when we're on this victory screen or whatever. So we had to force quit our game. Of course, we had to do more of that annoying deposit stuff where we had to fly around looking for items to deposit and then we had to go do it again. And then we go inside this cool factory, which was cool looking at least. It was a new setting. And at this point we we're willing to take whatever we could get. The boss fight wasn't too exciting though. There was a neat little puzzle that moves really fast and flickers a lot, but the puzzle was kind of fun to solve. And then once we completed that mission with the story that's really confusing at this point, we were led off to another free play level. This time, Dim had another large set of objectives that he had to fulfill. However, since Luke and I hadn't done the tombs from earlier, we couldn't even help him. Not that it would matter if we could help him because it doesn't collectively track progress. So while Dim had to go ahead and try to figure out what objectives were required for the next free play section and filler content to waste our time to make the game length seem longer, Luke and I were kind of stuck. So we 
we decided to try to make some progress on our tombs in the meantime, but it was pretty pointless at this point in the game. And on that note, that wrapped up our fifth night of Anthem. Day six, we were ready and determined to finally get to go through and finish up the campaign. Of course, things just can't be that simple. There was more filler type free roam levels that you have to fill in before you can actually start up the last level. So Dim had to go through that. It seemed a little bit unnecessary and pointless, but whatever. And finally, we were hopeful the last level would be some new environment or biome or something Something, and it was just the area from the tutorial except expanded upon a little bit. I don't know at this point in the story I was pretty much completely lost. I think we all were a little bit confused They kept using terminology of like these things that exist in the world with ever having a very clear explanation of what they actually do So it gets very easy just to hear almost anthem buzzwords and be like yeah something something anthem We got to stop the storm of the heart of the rage or something i don't know but mostly this level was just a lot of the same stuff from before just fighting through enemies and making our way through stuff but this level did have a very lengthy boss fight which was a little interesting because when you think of a final boss fight you think of it being like the ultimate challenge and honestly this final fight was long sure but it wasn't actually all that challenging it was just a very very bullet spongy boss that we just had to sit there shooting a lot just a ton for for his health to finally go down. There are some enemies flying around that do make it a little more annoying, but otherwise it wasn't really all that challenging. And there's kind of this little surprise ending to finish off the boss, which was kind of hilarious. So at the very least, I will give the game credit because the ending was a little bit clever. I mean, these guys just like come in and take that guy out just like that. And that's the end of the game. When you thought you had another 25% of bullet sponging to go, it was a little bit of a nice surprise. Anyways, after that, things just end on this happily ever after. After note, they're kind of looking forward to the future. Sure, there were some gaps in the story that kind of make you wonder about what happened to these other characters or this other thing, but I guess they're not important. I guess they'll be expanded upon in later seasons of the game or future sequels. But uh, yeah, that was that was pretty much Anthem for us. I don't know, I'm still feeling pretty conflicted because the gameplay itself felt tight. However, the story and the campaign structure was pretty lackluster to say the least. It makes the gameplay sting a little bit more because some parts of the game did feel good but the story and just the way the rest of the game went obviously didn't live up to the expectations those filler levels of just having to grind to make any progress were literally the most annoying thing in this entire game and a huge disappointment actually in how they just tried to artificially lengthen the game there really could have been a really good game here and I am kind of having to remind myself that when this game came out they charged people $60 to play this game it wasn't free to play it wasn't on game pass or EA access like how we got to play it their player base had to spend some good money to play this game and it kind of just dropped the ball and was a pretty massive disappointment so I can see where the backlash came from by the time the game was on game pass I think the game's reputation was already tarnished on the last day what we ended up doing was trying out the stronghold part of the game which is a part of the whole post game content we just wanted to see if strongholds were anything different from the actual campaign and more or less it's nothing too special it's just like like a long level that has a lot of clearing out enemies because so you have to clear out a lot of enemies and run around and do things like move propane tanks from point A to point B but it's mostly just killing a lot of enemies and then another really massive spongy boss fight that you have to take out it was pretty annoying actually this time around because it just felt like all of the random enemies that are flying around had a lot of health as well and were spongy and would just shoot at you and kill you or just distract you from shooting at the actual boss just making the whole process much longer. It's not like there was really intricate phases with the boss like you would see in something like Destiny. It was just like, hey, shoot at this thing so you can shoot at this thing, and that was about it. I decided to spend a little bit of my extra time though looking into Anthem and the release that the game had, and they had a roadmap lined up for how they were going to put content out for this game. Essentially, there was going to be three acts already planned out that were going to have smaller individual seasons with them, but while they were getting close to the end of the first act of content releasing which was pretty minimal at the very least it was little extra things being added into the game and tweaks and bug fixes the second act 
of the game and the third act would end up getting cancelled and they iterated that instead they were just gonna go for smaller seasons like that and have content rolling through that way. The writing was on the wall and it seemed like the game within a couple of months of already losing a player base and EA shuffling things around was already in really hot water for probably getting abandoned with how few people were still left playing the game. Like if you look through the patch notes you can see the list of things added into the game getting smaller and smaller with each iteration and less and less content getting added in. By Christmas time, about 10 months into the game's release, they had a very minimal Christmas thing built where really the map just looked Christmassy and there was like one new challenge you could do. And then there was talks that EA was moving people around to work on the future of Anthem and they were going to do an Anthem 2.0 update that would be massive. It was called Anthem Next. And actually the idea of having a core team going into the game to try to fix it up and bring the game to a standard that fans could expect for a game like this was actually a very promising idea. I think had Anthem Next actually been something that could have come out and been at the scale of what players would have expected, a lot of the players who maybe jumped in and tried the game and fell off quickly may have actually been willing to come back and give the game another try if the update seemed to have fixed a lot of these repetitive issues that the main game was kind of plagued with. There wasn't a really great gameplay loop that makes you want to come back. If they could have added that or found a way to fix the game up to make the progress loop feel better, I think a lot of people might have actually given the game a second chance. However, with the smaller team working on Anthem, eventually EA went to evaluate whether or not it was worth putting more resources, time, and personnel on the task of fixing Anthem up, and ultimately EA chose to pull the plug on the Anthem Next slash 2.0 update, and it ended up getting cancelled, where the game now just lays in a pretty dormant state, with its last update being from 1.0 seven, which was from February of 2020, and essentially was kind of the final patch that would put Anthem in kind of an autopilot mode where it would rotate out the store and weekly challenges and have the types of strongholds in rotation as well for challenges and kind of just leave the game off on that. And honestly, with EA wanting to kind of just wash their hands from Anthem and not try to dig in to try to make the game better, the likelihood of us ever seeing a sequel or follow-up seems incredibly unlikely, which is disappointing because it seemed like a lot of people really did work hard on building the universe, the story, the atmosphere, and even the gameplay, but it all fell apart when it wasn't able to have a decent progress loop to make the gameplay meaningful and the experience something that fans want to keep coming back to and doing over and over again. They relied too much on the grind and not enough on necessarily having a good RPG loop or gameplay loop, and it just ended up falling short. But nonetheless, that was Anthem for you. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more adventures and video games using co-op like we did for this video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on. You can always change your mind later if you ended up not liking the content, but it would help us out a lot if you would subscribe and try the notifications out and maybe you'll like our next content we put out. That's it for today though. We'll see you all next time with a brand new video.